friends, I have a question for you. If you could build the ultimate gaming PC, what specs would you want on it? Well, for me, I'd certainly want it to be something powerful. I definitely want at least a megabyte of memory, and definitely a powerful CPU too, perhaps a Motorola 68000 or something similar. Oh, and I need to be able to run a host of software on it, so I need both a floppy drive and a hard drive. Maybe a CD drive if I'm feeling a bit adventurous. And as far as an operating system goes, compatibility with Windows 3.0 is a must. This is the Commodore Amiga 2000, a computer first released in 1987 for the princely sum of 1500 US dollars. That's over $3,400 in 2020 money. I'm Jamie from The Gamer, and this is the Mystery Game Files. Today's look, Commodore Amiga 2000, the $1,500 computer from 1987. If you open a dictionary to the word sexy, the Amiga 2000 definitely won't be there. But damn it, it should be. I don't know what it is about this big beige box, but there's something so beautifully retro about it. Perhaps it's the simplicity of the case's design. Or maybe it's the smaller, quirkier details. Perhaps it's the keyboard cable winding like an old telephone wire, or the Competition Pro joystick here being a one-button stick that just happens to have one button on each side of it so that left-handed folks can game comfortably. Or maybe it's even my Commodore 1084S RGB monitor that has the look and feel of an old TV. But I love it. That said, with a name like Amiga 2000, I think it's pretty obvious that this was not the first of the Amiga computers. The Amiga was created by Commodore, a company best known for creating the Commodore VIC-20 computer, the Commodore 64 computer, and going out of business thanks to terrible management in 1994. The Amiga was meant to be Commodore's way to truly innovate the home computer industry. And in 1985, two of the biggest names in computers were Apple and IBM. The previous year, Apple had released the Macintosh, which would go on to be incredibly iconic. And as for IBM... Okay, it was pretty bad for gaming and audio production, but I guess that doesn't matter much when your target audience is your average Bank of America office. Commodore was best known for making 8-bit computers, with their Commodore 64 having become one of the best-selling machines on the market. But by 1985, a new generation of computers was about to begin. Taking a cue from Apple, the first Amiga was announced at a huge event in mid-1985. This event was truly something spectacular too, and it really did make a lot of folks take note. There wasn't just corporate speak and a few quick demos, no no no. Commodore rented out the entire New York Lincoln Center for an event featuring Blondie, partying, and a live demonstration of creating art with an Amiga by Andy Warhol. All the art you're seeing on screen right now was actually created by Warhol on an original Amiga, which would later be renamed the Amiga 1000. If anything was proof that the Amiga was next-gen tech, this was it. I see a lot of folks nowadays go on and on about how PCs are so much more powerful than your average modern console. And while there is absolutely no denying that you can make a PC that's leaps and bounds more capable than your average console, the leap in power just isn't of the same order of magnitude as it was back in the 80s. I mean, the same year the Amiga 1000 came out, this thing was released. This thing. The NES is arguably the most iconic 8-bit console of all time, yet it released the same year as a fully-fledged 16-bit computer system. How is such a thing even possible? Well, the rough answer is capitalism. An NES would have cost you just $100, and that's with a copy of Super Mario Bros. As for an Amiga 1000, you'd be looking at just under $1,300, and that's without a monitor. If you want to actually be able to see the stuff that's on your computer, you'd have to either get a composite adapter, like this one, so you could hook it up to a TV, or, you know, actually plunk down the money for a monitor. It would cost you $300 for a monitor, 
And remember, this is 1985 money. This whole package is just over $3,500 in today's money. And it's for the launch model Amiga, not this Amiga. The Amiga would get better over time though. In 1987, two different revisions were released. These were the Amiga 500, an all-in-one wedge-shaped design with a built-in keyboard, and the Amiga 2000, which was a beefed-up natural evolution of the A1000. These sold for 700 and 1500 US dollars respectively, and after a series of price cuts, the A500 alone would propel the Amiga range to massive success. Well, in Europe anyways. Back while the Amiga was still in development, Commodore bigwig Jack Trammell would leave the company for a variety of reasons. He'd leave Commodore to take control of their main competitor, Atari. Trammell leaving Commodore didn't immediately kill the company, it just seemed to cause a lack of direction. In North America, anyways. I don't know what was up with Commodore's UK branch, but the folks in the States should have just imported their management. Commodore UK started bundling A500s with software and marketing it as a proper games machine. And you know what? It seemed to work out pretty well for them. Of course, Commodore USA would keep pumping out new Amiga revisions over time. There was the Amiga 3000 in 1990, which was just a mild upgrade over the 2000. Then, there were the Amiga 1200 and 4000 in 1992, which featured new, upgraded hardware that made them true evolutions of the then 7-year-old tech. There was even the Amiga 600, which was just an A500, but bad. Oh, and we can't forget the Amiga CD32 games console, because nothing says successful American game system like unable to be released in the United States because of a shitload of debt. Again though, you really gotta hand it to Commodore UK. Even when presented with lackluster products, they seem to legitimately try to make the best of it. Imagine this. You're having a friend over for dinner. You're wanting to make some seafood and they're like, oh yeah, I'll bring some fish. So your friend shows up at your house and instead of having some market bot coho salmon chilling in some ice or whatever, they just reach into their bag and drop a barely still living mystery fish onto your counter. You're terrified. The fish is flopping around. The entire kitchen is starting to smell like a great lake. And right when you think it can't get any worse, your friend grabs a butcher knife and cuts the fish's head off right in front of you. You are especially horrified now. The counter is all a splatter with fish guts. And your friend just turns and smiles to you and says, Oh, this is perfect! This is just as I planned it! So now, replace the word fish with Amiga 600, and that's how I imagine it was for Commodore UK whenever Commodore USA brought them a great new product to release back in the 90s. Bet that jerk-ass friend didn't even wash his hands, either. My A2000 isn't completely stock. It has a CD drive in it instead of an internal hard drive, and it also has a 486 emulator board inside of it. That means I can play late 80s and early 90s DOS games on it if I really want to. Also, fun fact, my Amiga was sent to me by a friend in Germany. And I live in Canada, which has different types of power outlets, so that means I have to run this thing through a step up and down converter just to get it running properly. No joke though, I think it's worth the trouble to set up, just because of how much fun I have getting my retro gaming fix with this thing. I think talking about the Amiga games and demo scene is worth a video of its own as well, and if those are videos you want to see, then just say hey Jamie talk about more weird old computer stuff in the comments below. For now, I want to give just a brief sampler of what the Amiga was capable of. There were excellent original titles such as Turrican and Lemmings, and there's ports of arcade games such as Ghosts and Goblins, and even versions of PC classics such as SimCity 2000. As for operating systems, while sure, I can run stock Amiga OS on this thing, if I really want, I can defy science and run Windows 3.0 on it instead. And that's not the only other OS it could run either. There is an old rumor that the best classic Mac out there was an Amiga, and while I can't verify that for myself, I'm willing to trust pretty much anyone who starts a rumor about retro Macs on the internet. Oh, and as for productivity software, yeah, we've got that. 
Even if it's not as good as a Model M keyboard, I love typing on the Amiga keyboard here, and this is certainly a valid computer to type up a book report on. The Amiga range of computers were incredible. Well, for the time anyways. But really, there is no practical reason to own a computer like this anymore, unless you're just some YouTuber in Canada who's trying to desperately fill a void in their life. But really, in all seriousness, the Amiga is an often overlooked platform. There are some incredible games for it, and if it weren't for this platform, many popular games that folks absolutely adore nowadays may have never been created, and a whole generation of game developers may have never had their chance to shine. This is my first time talking about the Amiga on the Mystery Game Files, but I certainly hope it isn't the last. The A2000 may have cost over $1,500 when it first released, but I think it's fair to say that the impact this computer has had on me is priceless. So with that, that's it for this look at the Commodore Amiga 2000. What retro computers and retro games should we look at in the future? Let us know down in the comment section below, and while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to The Gamer for more great regular gaming content. I'm Jamie, this is the Mystery Game Files, and I'll see y'all next time.